So, good morning, afternoon, uh, depending on when you're listening to this. My name is Eric Mathis. I am the Debate Ambassador Coordinator, Emory Debate Coach, AUD alum, all things UDL debate apparently. My job here today, and I hope by the way, I also uh, create the packet. And my job today is to teach you all how to debate to K. And if you're looking at this, you should also be accompanied by a PowerPoint that will go directly from what I'm saying and will go in the same type of order. So you should be able to follow along with me as we go along. There are some animations in the PowerPoint slide. So for example, if you click on it right now, there will be something that says a quick introduction or maybe not so quick. So the purpose of today's lecture, if you move to the next slide, we will talk about uh, definitions and purpose of a critique. We will talk about key terms, parts of a critique and their responsibilities. How should the affirmative respond? And then there's a Q&A. And what that Q&A is, if your students or even you as a coach have questions about criticisms, you can email us or contact us here at the Atlanta Urban Debate League and let us know what those questions are and we'd be more than happy to help you, okay? So let's begin. If you click on slide three, you will see that we're starting with the definition of a critique. And the way that I describe this is an argument criticizing the desirability of the 1AC. Let's say this again. An argument criticizing the desirability of the 1AC. Now, what does that mean? Well, desirability means something that is desirable. And when I say criticizing the desirability of the 1AC, I'm criticizing what makes the judge vote for the 1AC. So if you're reading the AV, it probably has something to do with the fact that it prevents conflict in the South China Sea or a conflict between the United States and China. A criticism starts from the, and this is very important, notice it says 1AC, not the plan text. So the plan text is normally what is used to focus on a disad or a counter plan if you're in middle school, varsity, or high school. But the criticism itself or a critique focuses on the assumptions of the 1AC, both seen and unseen. So when we say things that are unseen, we're talking about, and there's an, there's an example that's in the PowerPoint that we'll go over, that there are things that the AV says that are not ex directly said by the 1AC, and we'll talk about that. What values does the 1AC stand for, right? 1ACs, or people that run critiques, believe that an affirmative stands for a certain cause or a value. Generally, affirmatives may start from the pretense that China is doing something bad, and, and America, the U.S., needs to correct that behavior. Well, the assumption is, is that the U.S. can correct that behavior. And the unseen part is that the U.S. isn't the one that participates that causes China to act uh, aggressively in the first place. The value that it stands for is that American way is right and the Chinese way is wrong. And lastly, there are methods, right? And methods are just the method that we choose in a debate to determine the impacts. We'll go over that when it comes to the alternative. Now, now the next slide is called the purpose. And if you click through it, you'll see things that come up. Like, for example, the first thing should say, test the assumptions of the 1AC. So when we test the assumptions of the 1AC, let's go back. Remember when I said that an affirmative that says that China is doing something bad and the U.S. has to correct that behavior? The assumption is that the U.S. is the country that should correct that behavior. More importantly, that the U.S. is good and that China is bad. A criticism would say that that assumption that the U.S. is right or well, the U.S. is always right, is a flawed assumption. For example, the assumption that all vegetarians like mac and cheese is a very bad assumption. Just because someone doesn't eat meat doesn't also mean that they like macaroni and cheese. But you've made an assumption about that, and those assumptions can sometimes be incorrect. If you click on the slide again, another word will come up, and it's called worldview. Worldview, right? When I say the worldview, I'm referring to the world that the affirmative portrays. So in the world that the affirmative portrays, go back to when I said that the AV presents a worldview that America is the good cop going in to fight the bad Chinese government. We've made assumptions and we painted a worldview that the U.S. is the ethical actor. And by ethics, I mean the country that can determine what is right and wrong. That is probably a bad assumption that most critiques would say because most critiques would say that that is an incorrect assumption. You should not assume that America knows what's right and what's wrong especially in international politics. A critique changes how we evaluate impacts. So in a disad debate, neither team disagrees that whoever present, prevents the most deaths 
generally will win the debate. But with a criticism, a judge is presented with an option of not evaluating the debate as a policymaker or as a person that can stop the most uh, deaths in a particular debate round, but they are asked to be an educator or a, um, a ethical decision maker, and the critique says you should evaluate those negative assumptions and determine whether or not those are good or bad or problematic before you can evaluate the 1AC and its impacts. So let me say that a little bit differently. A critique says that before we can prove that the AF is a good idea, we need to test these assumptions to ensure that those assumptions don't complicate the 1AC and what it stands for. Okay? So if you are someone that has a peanut allergy, you will not want to just hand someone any piece of food. You will want to test whether or not there are peanuts in it to ensure that that type of food is good for the person that is about to consume it. And the next point is that the, one of the purposes of a critique is to bring historical and structural concerns into a debate. Historical concerns may be the way in which we have treated China historically in the world, the way in which we have used capitalism to frame China in a negative light. Structural concerns are about the structure that we operate in, institutions, why those institutions may present a very flawed notion, the uh, academics or the academic realm in which we uh, portray China, right? It, notice that a lot of our policymakers make the assumption that China is someone that we should be fearful of. But the structural or historical concerns will be, well, they're not actually someone that we should be afraid of when we do this for our own personal well-being. We do it for our own personal self. The government needs to frame China as a threat so we can continue to do things like ask for more money for the military and so on and so forth. So we have an example, and I think this is a great example to use for your, with your students, and I think your students will be able to grasp this, and we'll work through it together. If you click on it, you will see 1AC, and then click on it again, you will see inherency, harms, a plan, and solvency. Very simple. The inherency is that the Indy kids are hungry, right? There was a camp held at Emory, it's called the Indy, and those kids at that camp are currently hungry. The harms are hungry kids will stop coming to the Indy, i.e. the Emory Debate Institute, and the lab leaders will lose money. Them losing money means they will become bank robbers. That may lead them to getting arrested and then going to jail. The plan is to build a McDonald's inside of Harris Hall, which is a dorm here at Emory University, to give free food to the Indy students. And the last argument is solvency, because the point of solvency is to prove that the plan can solve the problems of the status quo. Can it solve the kids being hungry in the first place? Solvency says that the Indy students get food and they won't be hungry. Seems simple enough, right? But let's click on the uh, PowerPoint and oh, there it is, the unknown or unseen assumptions. There are assumptions that are in this one you see that are problematic. Can you think of some? Take a moment. See if you can figure out what some of the things that are being said here that you might find problematic. One person might say that it assumes that McDonald's is something that you should put in your mouth. I would agree. McDonald's isn't exactly the most edible food. What if you have a room full of students that don't eat meat? Well, that limits the options um, for who gets what food. Or maybe you look at the fact of, well, who determines what student gets what food? Who determines who gets the most food? Right? That assumption means that there is someone that gets to make a value assessment on who, what students deserve to get the most food. That could also be very, very problematic. It is also problematic to assume that just because the lab leaders lose money that they instantly become criminals. Why did you make that assumption? These are unseen and unknown assumptions. I'm sure your students can uh, highlight some of their own. And once you start of doing that kind of a process, you're actually doing the link work uh, on establishing the link of the 1AC or a link to the criticism via the 1AC. Now in the next part, we will talk about the parts of a critique. First we have the link. But before I even go into the link, do know the word uniqueness is not there. Criticisms are, uh, critiques are not like dissads. They do not have uniqueness. They're what we call non-unique dissads and the alternative functions as a counterplan. And what that means is, is that the alternative says that the links must be resolved via a different method. Remember the word I said before that was method. So the link you can think of as an example of 
the flawed assumptions that show up in the 1AC. So if you use our McDonald's example, remember the fact that it is an assumption to assume that all lab leaders will become criminals if they don't get money from the Indy. That is a flawed assumption. Here is where that flawed assumption or that bad assumption shows up in the 1AC. An impact is no different than an impact that you would see in a normal disad debate. The only difference is, is that impact will say that if we continue that flawed assumption, that flawed way of thinking, these impacts will inevitably never be solved. An alternative asks the question of how do we approach the 1AC to resolve the issues of these flawed assumptions? And what's a different way of resolving them? It's sort of like a counter plan, but it doesn't use the, poli the politics of the 1AC. So it doesn't use the United States federal government, it doesn't use Congress, it doesn't use the president. It, and it generally will say things like, we should rethink those assumptions and try to think of better ways to resolve these problems. Because as long as we continue those flawed assumptions, we can never be able to solve those issues. And then the last argument is an argument that is called framework. Framework is an argument that dictates to the judge how they should see the debate. The AF will get up and their framework for the debate will be the judge should be a policymaker and should only vote on the plan versus the status quo or a competitive policy option like a counter plan. But the critique would say that instead of us evaluating the impacts that way, we should evaluate whether or not there are problematic assumptions in the 1AC. And if there are, those things must come first. You will hear this a lot, a prior question, which means that we have a prior question to ask before we can determine whether or not the AF is a good or bad idea. Now, on the slide that says affirmative responses, you'll see I've typed in STOP. That does not mean stop reading or stop this lecture, but STOP is an acronym for, if you click on the slide, solvency deficit versus the alternative, theory, offense, and permutations. Permutations are just like what you hear in MAV, which is a combination of the plan and the alternative. The permutation will say that we should do both. We should do what the 1AC said, but we should also include a rejection of flawed assumptions and move forward. The AF plan may not be perfect. The negative has pointed that out. We should continue to solve both issues. A solvency deficit is what the alternative doesn't do that the plan does. So one way to look at a solvency deficit is to make an argument that says that only the federal government can correct these assumptions. Your alternative doesn't embrace that which means you cannot solve for the issues of the 1AC, and whatever the alternative cannot solve, that becomes a reason for why the AV should win, because the AV can do something that the alternative can't. If I can jump higher than my little brother, I can reach things on the top shelf that my brother can't. I have a comparative advantage over my brother. Theory arguments are a little bit more complex. We'll have an in-depth theory discussion along with topicality in a later lecture for uh, our UDL, our students, and our uh, coaches. So let's hold off on that one. The last one is offense. If an argument makes the assumption that uh, capitalism is a flawed economic system, then offense would be, no, capitalism is a great system, and here are the reasons why. And that's my lecture. Um, that is a short, sweet way of understanding the criticism. My name is Eric Mathis. If you have questions about anything that we have said, or if you have uh, some concerns or ask more in-depth questions on how can I structure these arguments a lot better for my students, please shoot us an email. We'll be more than happy to talk to you. Have a nice day.